Howdy. Howdy. I'm Ryan Crocker, Dean of the Bush School of Government and Public Service, and I'm delighted to welcome you here this evening for another Mossbacker conversation in public policy. Um, Lori Taylor, our Mossbacker Institute director, will be um, in introducing Richard Fisher, our uh, featured speaker, who will be giving us some reflections on globalization. Um, we kind of have a twofer tonight. Um, uh, very pleased that uh, Rob Mossbacker will be uh, carrying on a conversation with Ambassador Fisher after his remarks. Um, Rob Mossbacker is someone I've known for a decade. Uh, uh, he was uh, head of the Overseas Private uh, Investment Corporation, OPIC, when I was ambassador to Pakistan. And he came out with um, a suitcase full of the most creative ideas uh, I've, I've had ever heard in my government career uh, for how the US government could support private investment in uh, highly unlikely places uh, like Pakistan. Uh, uh, like, like your, your father did a generation before, you revolutionized, Rob, the way um, uh, uh, government and the private sector uh, can interact. And of course, uh, we're here tonight for a Mossbacker Institute program named for uh, the legendary Secretary of Commerce, Bob Mossbacker, um, a, a part of President Bush's uh, dream team. Uh, uh, a, a cabinet, uh, the quality of which um, we haven't seen since and, and rarely before. So, Rob, delighted to have, have you here tonight as well. Um, uh, we also have uh, Don Powell joining us, a former Texas A&M region, regent, and most importantly to us now, uh, the head of the Bush School Advisory Board, and Warren Finch, uh, my colleague, the uh, uh, the head of the, uh, the, the Bush Library. Welcome to you all. You didn't come here to hear me. Uh, you came here to hear Lori Taylor just a little bit more. You mainly came to hear Richard Fisher and Rob Mossbacker. So, Lori. <coughs> Good evening and welcome. Uh, Dean Crocker was absolutely right. You didn't come here to hear me either. And so it's my task to introduce to you someone who should need no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, Richard W. Fisher, he was president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas for the decade from 2005 through 2015. He's only recently stepped down from that position. As a, a president of a Federal Reserve Bank, he was a member of the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee making uh, decisions about monetary policy in the United States and therefore had one, his fingers on one of the major levers that influence our economy. Prior to becoming the president of the Dallas Fed, Mr. Fisher was the vice chairman of Kissinger McLarty and Associates, demonstrating his bipartisan chops by working with uh, Henry Kissinger, the former Secretary of State for Presidents Nixon, Ford, and, and Nixon and Ford, and Mark McLarty, the former White House Chief of Staff in the Clinton administration. I'm obviously a little bit nervous. I was at the Fed for 14 years, and this is really important to me, and I'm really thrilled that you're here. So I'd like, to, without further ado, to introduce Mr. Fisher, Ambassador Fisher, actually, the Deputy United States Trade Representative responsible for U.S. trade policy and negotiations in Asia, Latin America, Mexico, and Canada. Uh, Mr. Fisher, Ambassador Fisher, is a, an asset and a, a great joy for me to introduce him to you all tonight. Ambassador Fisher. Well, thank you very much for having me here tonight, Mr. Ambassador. Um, I appreciate your service, and you were very kind in speaking about Rob and, and letting Lori speak about me, but you perform notably for our country, and we're lucky to have you here. And Dr. Taylor, I thank you for your brief introduction. That was nice and to the point. Um, I'm especially pleased to be here for a Mossbacker evening. Um, Secretary Mossbacker, Rob's father, as you mentioned, Mr. Ambassador, was not only a, a terrific oil man, a magnificent entrepreneur, one of the greatest yachtsmen in the world, uh, but served us well 
and especially dear to my heart because he was the cabinet officer who oversaw NAFTA, which I had the job of implementing when I was serving in the Clinton administration as the deputy USTR. He was also a personal friend. He was a supporter of mine. But the best thing he gave me was Rob, his son. And we've had a friendship that I've cherished from the very moment we met, which, as we just reminded ourselves, is increasingly we can say it was long ago. The older we get, we just hope we keep moving in the same direction. Uh, I'm very glad to spend a night with the men and women of Texas A&M. Uh, there's no more devoted body of students or alumni through whose veins flows Aggie blood. It's infamous and famous as well. And I uh, keep thinking with this great university has contributed to our nation is truly remarkable. Um, cabinet members like Bob Gates, and uh, I looked it up, seven Medal of Honor recipients, 11 members of Congress, 10 Nobel laureates. My favorite was Norman Borlaug because he was my Little League baseball coach. Um, my daughter, when she heard he got the Nobel Prize, was convinced he got it for coaching baseball. Uh, and of course, entrepreneurs like George P. Mitchell, who I like to remind people, uh, single-handedly brought about what I consider to be the energy independence of this country. And I'm especially glad, and Rob, I want you to keep thinking about this, he did it after the age of 60. So there is potential for both of us out there. And of course, you've produced countless athletes, uh, again, by my count, 34 Olympians came out of this great university. And then two of my all-time favorites, Robert O'Keen, and uh, of course, Lyle Lovett. Uh, I was at the Sons of Herman Hall when Robert O'Keen ad-libbed that he uh, was singing when he was singing the front porch song. And uh, it made me, took me back to my freshman year, my plebe year at the Naval Academy when he said that after taking their exams, quote, we was wondering where we were going to go when our parents got our grades. <laughs> um, anyway, you didn't come to hear me wax on about how great Maggie Land is or uh, my favorite uh, singer. Um, but I am going to draw upon a decade of experience of presidency and the CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, and then Rob and I are going to talk more about globalization when we have our uh, porch conversation here. As you mentioned, Lori, I've had the privilege of spending 10 years as president and CEO of the Dallas Fed, 10 years of sitting on the Federal Open Market Committee where monetary policy for the United States is decided, and um, I had the great privilege of serving under three different chairmen of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, and Janet Yellen. I want to give you a little quick background on the Fed because not everybody fully understands it. Uh, when it's fully staffed, the Federal Open Market Committee, which is where we sit together to decide monetary policy, is composed of 19 individuals. There are seven governors that are appointed, like Rob and I were in our different capacities before, by the President of the United States, confirmed uh, by the United States Senate, uh, and they overlap the presidency. And then there are 12 Federal Reserve Bank presidents who are not presidential appointees, nor are they civil servants, and they are not subject to Senate confirmation. They are running private banks. The governors all live in and around Washington. They office in Washington. The presidents and uh, the banks that they run are spread across the country. This was a system that was put into place in 1913. It was in that year that the Fed became the third central bank in the history of our country. And it has operated intact for now for 102 years. Now, the first bank in the United States was championed by Alexander Hamilton. It was commissioned by George Washington, set up in 1791, but was closed in 1811 when Congress failed to renew its charter. The second bank in the United States was chartered in 1816. Andrew Jackson uh, hated it. He campaigned to close it, and he succeeded to do so in 1836, after which the financial panic of 1837 took grip and one of the Great Depressions in our history, which lasted for seven years. But it was not until the private Knickerbocker Bank in New York failed in 1907 and set off the so-called rich man's panic and a fierce global depression that an effort took place to put in a more sophisticated and lasting modern central bank. And thus, in 1913, President Wilson signed the Federal Reserve Act. And what made this third bank of the United States so unique and politically palatable was that it was established with 12 Federal Reserve districts spread across the country, each headquartered by a bank and uh, its branches uh, in different states. Now, if you have a Federal Reserve note in your pocket, you might call it a dollar bill. Uh, you might notice that on its front are four numbers. Uh, 
their letter between 1 and 12. And to the left, as you face the portrait of George Washington, there is a letter somewhere between A and um, the letter L. And if you're lucky, you'll have in your pocket a bill that has 11, four 11s on the front, and the letter K to the left of President Washington as you look at the bill, with two concentric circles around it. The outer circle says Federal Reserve Texas, the inner circle says Bank of Dallas. And uh, K is, of course, the 11th letter in the English alphabet. It's a pretty clever code that, because it represents the 11th Federal Reserve District. The Soviets could never have figured out how to decipher that little code. <laughs> Uh, but let me give you a, a secret little thought that I hope makes you proud as Texans. Those of you that have what we call Dallas dollars in your pocket with the K stamped on the front and the 411s on the front, they're worth more than all those others from the other Federal Reserve banks. <laughs> the Dallas Fed has branches in El Paso and uh, Houston and San Antonio, and it serves the needs of 28 million citizens and several hundred banks in Texas. A small sliver of Louisiana, I don't want to offend Louisianans, but what we call the productive part of Louisiana, not a very large part of Louisiana, <laughs> and uh, southern New Mexico. So um, I thought very, very briefly I would just review the course of what we went through and why the Fed is in its position now, and it does actually collide with the issue of globalization. Um, I'm not going to go through the financial crisis. I will just simply say that what we needed to do at the time was what central banks are called upon to do throughout history, open the floodgates, make the markets uh, work. I want to remind you that every single financial market in the nation failed. From the most basic financial instruments, bankers' acceptances, commercial paper, interbank lending. Uh, you may have forgotten that the very first money market fund set up in the United States broke the buck. Uh, and if you don't have working financial markets, you cannot conduct commerce. And we had an implosion. Rob and I can talk about why that occurred, but we know that history. Uh, and um, one of the things that we did and were commanded to do by virtue of our franchise was to then make sure that we restored the financial markets and we put trillions of dollars at risk to do so. Uh, it worked. Uh, we lent against collateral that people had questions about and we were often questioned about and doubted. Uh, we didn't lose a penny on what we put to work in terms of rescuing the system. Uh, we expected at the time that we would have the cooperation of the fiscal authorities. And one of the constant themes that you'll hear me speak about is monetary policy cannot carry an economy. It provides the liquidity, the lubrication, the gasoline for the engine, as it were. But to incent people to step on the accelerator and move the economy forward, you have to have working fiscal policy and regulatory policy. And you know as well as I do that our fiscal authorities have failed us miserably. And so it fell upon the backs of the Federal Open Market Committee, by then under the leadership under, of Ben Bernanke, to uh, really pour on the gasoline, so to speak. And the way I like to think about it is we went first from taking the patient and rescuing it, taking him into the ER room, uh, and then administering a little morphine to uh, get him to come back to his senses and ease the pain. Uh, but then as we gradually went through the program of being required to do more because the fiscal authorities were doing nothing and in fact were giving us contradictory policy, uh, one of the unfortunate things is we torqued up the administration of the drugs that we were feeding the patient. We mixed a little cocaine, a little heroin in there and um, <laughs> got it really zippy, got it going. By uh, the year uh, 2009, by March 6th of 2009, we had not only cut interest rates to zero, we had uh, purchased $2 trillion in securities in the open marketplace. When you buy something, you pay for it. And by March of 2009, we had purchased $2 trillion in U.S. Treasuries and in mortgage-backed securities, starting with mortgage-backed securities to get the housing market back to life. Uh, the Congress limits the power of the Federal Reserve to buying just those two instruments. And indeed, it was on March 6th of 2009 that the stock market turned. Interest rates had come down dramatically. Eventually, they would reach the lowest level in 239 years of recorded history. And then the spreads of other fixed income instruments, including those of what are known as junk bonds or triple C credits, uh, would narrow to the historically lowest point in their recorded history, even though they don't go back 239 years. 
And since then, of course, the stock market has tripled. The decision at the table was that we would create a wealth effect, that by uh, making money free and abundant, that we would expect that since we purchased these securities from depository institutions, what we know as banks, that's the franchise of the Federal Reserve, that they would put that money to work, lending to small and medium-sized businesses in particular. 82% of all the jobs in America are created by small and medium-sized businesses. But instead, they put it back to us. They put it back on the balance sheet of the 12 Federal Reserve banks. And right now, as I speak, we, uh, I can't say we anymore, they at the Federal Reserve have 2.65 trillion in excess reserves sitting on the balance sheet of the 12 Federal Reserve banks. Notice I didn't say sitting on Washington's balance sheet. There is no Federal Reserve in Washington. There are no vaults in Washington. There are no operations in Washington. Think of it as the school administration and the 12 banks as the schoolhouses. So that money is sitting fallow after three rounds of quantitative easing. And the real question is, what happens next? So as to the present state of the economy, we are indeed an economy that is operating in a globalized, cyberized world. Um, the world has changed. My very first speech as head of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas was at Harvard University. I gave the Whitehead Lecture excuse me, the Weatherhead Lecture. Uh, I had founded at the Dallas Fed the Center for Globalization and Monetary Policy. I asked the staff to search uh, through every search engine possible across the net. The interaction of those two and where globalization and monetary policy were combined, two hits. Wolford had written the great book on interest rates never mentioned globalization. The Lexus and the Olive Tree never mentioned financial markets. How times have changed. And right now we have a fiercely competitive market for capital and for economic trade and for economic growth. It's my firm view that North America is the epicenter of global economic growth. And when I say North America, I want to harken back to Secretary Mossbacher and also the work that Rob and I have done because when I say North America, I don't just mean the United States. The United States, Mexico, and Canada, even though Canada right now is suffering from the standpoint of their commodity base, uh, but Mexico is definitely not. Mexico is the last to go into recession, the first to come out, the first to make the structural changes that only they and Poland were able to achieve during the period of crisis. Uh, and you may not be aware of this, but the inflation rate in Mexico today is running at 2%, and economic growth is running at 2% more than that, and job growth is running at 5% as they have become more professional and formalized in their economy. Now, I used to say that during the crisis that the U.S. was still the best looking horse in the glue factory. Uh, but I'm convinced when I look at the other horses on the track, including China, that we are indeed secretary at, at Belmont in 1973. We lead by 30 lengths at least. And if we had a Congress and fiscal policy and regulatory policy that would encourage our job creators, the small and medium-sized businesses of our country that create 82% of the jobs in this country, we'd be even more than 30 lengths ahead. I'm constantly asked about the outlook for interest rates, and I will tell you this, just in this room. <laughs> rates will be raised sometime in the next 100 years. <laughs> um, the current task that is faced by Chairwoman Yellen and the members of the Federal Open Market Committee is to wean the markets from what was put in place after that heavy dose of narcotics that we gave the marketplace, the shots we gave the marketplace leading up to 2009. And I use the analogy of Ritalin. There's been a desire to keep things calm, to maintain financial stability, in order for entrepreneurs to feel comfortable and small, medium, and large-sized businesses to take advantage of that to start the process of job creation, knowing that they have a hand tied behind their back because of bad fiscal policy. And yet you must begin normalization without creating financial turbulence. I do think December would be sound timing to get started. And that's why I think you're hearing the chair and Vice Chair Fisher, Stanley Fisher, by the way, he spells his name wrong, he's got a C in there, but he's a great guy, <laughs> um, broadcasting well in advance the expectation that indeed Lucy We'll stop moving the football every time we get up to it at an FOMC meeting, keep it there, 
and start kicking the ball down the road with a very slight increase in interest rates. Monetary policy will still be extremely accommodative. There's a lot of liquidity out there in the system. If you take that figure of $2.65 trillion in excess reserves, that means banks have more than there is demand for them to lend, and you take it and multiply it by a factor of nine, you'll get a sense of how much cash is rolling around in the hull of the ship of the United States economy. Because we have money market funds and we have enormous piles of cash being held by the dealers and by private corporations and large corporations, et cetera. If you take that number and multiply by nine once more, you get a sense of how much instant liquidity there is in the global economy at large. We are awash in cash, which is why we won't have a quantitative easing round four or five or QE infinity as some people expected, because you'd just be pushing on a string. It's there, it's not being used, there's a lot of it. But the idea is to somehow r start raising rates without scaring the markets. And uh, you know, sometimes you just have to do things that may be disagreeable. And we are listening to certain economists, very prominent economists, people like Larry Summers and others, who think it is disagreeable to start now, that you want to wait till you see the whites of the eyes of full employment and inflation that pierces through the 2% target that the Fed has memorialized, like most central banks. Um, even though they've forgotten that in the 102-year history of the Federal Reserve, every single time they've waited to that moment to begin the process of tightening monetary policy without exception, over 102 years, they've brought about a recession. And it's the feeling at the table that we cannot run that risk again with the recent traumatic injury uh, having been so close to our hearts of what we went through in 2007, 2008, 2009. So it is indeed uh, disagreeable to some of the great economic thinkers. Every time I hear the term disagreeable, I think of the great speech that Winston Churchill gave at the Waldorf Hotel in London in 1926 on March 15th where he said, in finance, everything that is agreeable is unsound, and everything that is sound is disagreeable. The burden on the Yellen FOMC is intense. For the verdict on zero interest rate policy and quantitative easing, indeed, the legacy of the unprecedented programs put in place by the Open Market Committee under the leadership of Ben Bernanke will depend on how the committee engineers the exit, as we call it, and achieves normalization of interest rates and the Fed's balance sheet. When I started the Fed, it was 900 billion. That was our footings. It's now closer to 5 trillion. We don't yet know if that legacy will be a felicitous one or the stuff of tears. Now, some have said that the Fed is caught in a Hotel California trap, that they're, quote, prisoners of their own device, the great lyrics from uh, that wonderful band, and while you can check out at any time you wish, from their hyper-accommodated monetary policy, uh, you can never leave, to quote the Eagles. Um, I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper, and when I'm on college campuses, I like to make literary references. I hope you'll forgive me. Obviously, I have some differences. I was uh, a dissenter on QE3. I thought it was overkill, and I was afraid that we were firing all the bullets in our holster, and if we did slide backwards, uh, we wouldn't have anything else to play with. And I pray that this will all end very happily. Not long ago, I had a very sobering conversation with a wise man who knows nothing about economics, but much about human nature. And I want to tell you a little bit about it. This is with the iconic film star, uh, Michael York. Michael's a friend of mine of long standing. We were friends when we were students at Oxford. And he was a great Shakespearean actor at Oxford and later on the London stage. I can see by your faces, very few of you know who he is. You might remember him better as D'Artagnan in the Three Musketeers film series or Basel Exposition in Austin Powers, my favorite role. He was even the voice of Mason Fairbanks, which is supposed to be Homer Simpson's father. Uh, but I know him best as Lucentio in Shakespeare's play, The Taming of the Shrew, and then as Tybalt in the most brilliant Shakespearean film I've ever seen, done by Zeffirelli as Romeo and Juliet. And over ribs and brisket the other night at Sammy's Barbecue in Dallas, Michael asked me to explain monetary policy. <laughs> uh, so I did my earnest best, tried to keep it simple. And after listening carefully, he suggested it all sounds to him like an unfinished 
Shakespearean play. And then he said, quote, do you think it's a play, Richard, that ends happily or ends in tragedy? Is it all's well that ends well? Or is it Troilus and Cressida? Well, it just happens that in college, I loved all's well that ends well. After much toing and froing, it ends as do all Shakespearean comedies in marriage, in this case of Diana to Count Bertram, and all the world rejoices, and it's a happy place. But then I recall that it is in this play that Shakespeare coined a phrase which we are all familiar with. That was the first time anybody had ever written too much of a good thing. And I have been worried that especially the third round of quantitative easing that took us from $2 trillion to $4.65 trillion has been too much of a good thing. It has, no doubt, felicitously lubricated the financial markets to a level of intoxication with cheap money and continued elevated returns to an almost extreme degree. But problems may still be lurking. In today's Wall Street Journal, there is a great op-ed, which I urge you to read, by Michael Thompson, the chairman of the S&P Investment Advisory Services. He notes that driven by a reach for returns in the zero interest rate environment, 11% of 401k accounts managed at Fidelity for people ages 50 to 54 are 100% invested in stocks. And he goes on, and I quote, all told, 18% of the firm's account holders in an age bracket have a stock allocation at least 10 points higher than recommended, and that figure increases to 27% among people ages 55 to 59, an age when one is supposed to be migrating to less risky exposure. And citing various statistics, Thompson concluded, and this is from this morning's paper, uh, it may all end very badly. Quote, it'll be a hard lesson in how much easier it is to add monetary accommodation than it is to remove it, end of quote. Which makes one wonder if this is what is perhaps the economic equivalent of Troilus and Cressida. I hated that play when I studied it in college. But if you haven't read it, I don't care if you're an economist or a political scientist or a literary major, you should. It's perhaps the most complicated of all of Shakespeare's works. And in reviewing it, the great scholar of Shakespeare, Virgil Whitaker of Stanford wrote, and I quote, Troilus and Cressida remains an enigma. The customary dramatic categories will neither explain nor include it. And its fascination for the intellect cannot conceal its defects as art, end of quote. The unique programs that the Federal Reserve fashioned to weather the crisis and then secure the financial and real <coughs> economy most certainly do not fit into the customary categories of monetary policy making. Its authors, you're looking at one of them, and most learned economists consider it intellectually and theoretically fascinating. And yet, until it's unwound, until the entire play is over, we will not know what if any, its defects as monetary art truly are. So to me, even having been a part of the process, it remains to this day an enigma. And all of you remember Winston Churchill's widely quoted comment when he said it, it actually is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. But, Churchill went on, there is a key. Invite me back to give another lecture, and I'll give you that key. Thank you very much. Well, I, for one, am inviting him back next week. Uh, thank you all. I'd now like to introduce Rob Mossbacher, Jr., who is going to engage in a conversation about globalization. Uh, Rob Mossbacher is chairman of the Mossbacher Energy Group. From 1886 to 2005, he was president and CEO of that organization. He is, was sworn in as the ninth president and CEO of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, something the two gentlemen have in common, in October of 2005, uh, following confirmation by the United States Senate. These days, Mr. Mossbacher has been focusing on his role as founder, chairman, and CEO of BizCor a Washington-based nonprofit organization that places graduates of top American business schools with entrepreneurs in emerging markets to develop business plans and other strategies for growth. This core is currently operating in Colombia and Kenya, and we are very pleased to be uh, tell you about them 
and invite these two gentlemen to have at it. <laughs> Thank you, Laurie, very much. <coughs> and um, Richard, delighted to be here with you. Let me also say, uh, Ryan, thank you very much for the kind introduction as well. Um, I'm very, very proud to have the Mossbacker name associated with the school uh, in terms of the Bush School and also with Texas A&M University. It's a, it's a real honor, it really is. Um, so thank you for your usual erudite <laughs> explanation of uh, economics. Let me ask you, um, because obviously in the last 10 years you've been in and out of the uh, economics field and had no shortage of economists around you. Do you have any kind of explanation for kind of the challenge facing economists? Because it's very similar to the challenge I think facing many uh, weather forecasters. <laughs> That's right. I love to watch weather forecasts. They say 50% chance of this. Uh, how, how can you lose? You're going to watch the next <laughs> night. Anyway, uh, Rob, I think if you really look at the root of the crisis, it's because economists lost their way. And what I mean by that, and I know there are a lot of economists in the audience, and I'm not, by the way, I have to tell you up front, I'm not a PhD economist. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> uh, I'm an MBA, <laughs> and I studied economics as an undergraduate. But economists were moral philosophers. If you go back to Hume and Smith, uh, even Charles Dickens was an economist. He's a moral philosopher for his day. I love, there's a great quote of Dickens's in a book called Little Dorrit, where there are two characters standing on the street, and one says, what is insurance? And the other fellow gives the perfect definition of insurance. He says, insurance is when one person who cannot pay gets another person who cannot pay to say that he can pay. <laughs> <laughs> Derivatives, right? So, um, and we've mathematized. So we believe in rational e expectation theory, and. Um, you know, perfect markets or efficient market theory. Fisher Black, who unfortunately I was not related to either, uh, who created the, the Black-Scholes model, uh, learned something when he moved from Cambridge and Harvard down to New York. He said, you know, markets are efficient on the banks of the Charles River. You get to the Hudson River and you learn they're not efficient. So I think we've, uh, the f area of economics has become so mathematized and people believe in, uh, the theoretical basis of mathematized economics. Neither von Hayek nor Keynes ever wrote a single equation. They were philosophers, whether you agree with them or not. And I think we've forgotten the root. It's a logical system that's important. And it is not a science, it is an art form, it's judgment. So I think economics has lost its way. And yet every day you go from the newspaper and you'll see, as you will today, in today's Wall Street Journal, so many economists had thought X and it turned out to be Y. So my, my advice to you is not to take it too seriously, uh, but to keep it in context. And I'll conclude this question with uh, my favorite little story. Uh, one of the great economists of all time, uh, no Nobel laureate, uh, Ken Arrow, uh, been dead for many years, but one of the great thinkers, uh, was given the job during World War II, left academia. Uh, General Eisenhower had him in the European theater and his job was to forecast weather two months forward. And being an honest man, after right a while, he sent a cable to the commander and said, you know, I want to be honest with you. My forecasts are no good. You could roll a die and get the same outcome. And I cabled back, I know your forecasts are no good but I need them for planning purposes. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, <laughs> all right, let's transition from that into uh, globalization. We're, we're in an extraordinary era since Richard and I first met and uh, actually uh, and spent time together in, in 1986 uh, when we were both chosen as uh, one of the, I think, inaugural class right. of the British American Successor Generation Program, which was launched by some U.S. folks and some British folks who wanted to replicate the level of friendship and trust that existed during World War II with a successor generation. Uh, and we both happened to be part of that in 1986. So much has changed. Mm. And so as we talk about trade, and you spent time at USTR, and we have share this common affection for NAFTA, uh, it seems that the politics of trade have, if anything, gotten worse, and that even on agreements that uh, seem to be 
so compelling from an economic standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, there are opponents locked in, dead in, without knowing a thing about them. Tell me how and how can we develop more of a bipartisan consensus around the mm -hmm. benefits of trade agreements? Well, and, and let's assume they're they're good, balanced trade agreements. Right, right, right. Yeah. and fair and all fair this and stuff. All that. <laughs> um, I, I gave, I had a brief meeting because my plane had a mechanical difficulty and got here late with a class just before I came over here. And the subject was on trade and the Korean Trade Agreement and the Trans-Pacific Agreement. Uh, and I pointed out that until President George H.W. Bush, the greatest trading president we had was Grover Cleveland. He was the one to put in place numerous trade accords. Uh, of course, in those days, things were based on tariffs. You ran it through the Ways and Means Committee, which is the key committee that handles revenues and expenditures in the Congress, and still to this day is the committee that processes the initial trade agreements. But thanks to uh, President Bush 41, um, he put in place a everything from NAFTA, which your dad was so instrumental in and such a great hero about, uh, to the Uruguay Round, and of course, which matured up into the WTO and its development. Um, he was followed by another great free trading president, which was Bill Clinton. Imagine a Democrat running pro-NAFTA with the unions breathing down its back, one of the, the standard opposition groups on the left. So the point I like to make, Rob, is trade is a continuum. Uh, your dad and President Bush put the framework for NAFTA together, agreed to it with uh, the Mexican President Cedillo and the great Prime Minister in Canada. I had the job for four years of implementing and putting the, all the things together, uh, together under President uh, Clinton and Charlene Barczewski. And uh, you always almost see at the very end of a presidential term, after they are secure and the other issues they've gotten, a new trade initiative. And we saw it with the Korean Free Trade Agreement, which very few people talk about. And whether you like President Obama or not, he ought to get credit for it. And yet, in every presidential campaign, you see the extreme right dig in their heels and the extreme left. Always the unions are protectionist. And often, those companies that have the most to lose are protectionist. So I don't know that there's anything different. What it requires is leadership. Your dad, for example, to get things started. And you had gone through a very dry period. President Clinton, who was quite gutsy on this issue, to push those of us that were his negotiators, go do it. Open the door for China. Finish the, frankly, finish the war with Vietnam, which is my job. And, and that agreement I did with Vietnam was actually signed by 43. And open the world to trade. Because we know it's good for us go back to the origination of it, which was tariffs, you bring down costs for the American consumers. We're a consumption-driven society. Manufacturing is 12% of our output. People lament the decline of manufacturing, but it's a fact. We consume. We create services. We're the best in the world at services. We want to sell them elsewhere. And we want to be able to bring things in as inexpensively as possible. So we all know the logic. And I think what it takes, Rob, is the kind of leadership that your dad exhibited, that President Bush exhibited, that President Clinton exhibited. Uh, I'm not willing to go back and elect Grover Cleveland again. <laughs> uh, but I do think this just requires leadership. It's easiest to do at the end of a term. Most presidents become quite globally oriented at the end of a term. Yeah. Yeah. But I'd like to see people, if anything, and I know this may be an anathema in this audience, I was amazed that Clinton led with his chin on that one. And remember, Ross Perot was against, and he was a formidable force. Uh, so you had Bush, you had Clinton, both were pro-trade, and then you had Ross that was anti-trade, uh, for reasons I still cannot understand. He's a decent and good man and a smart business guy. But those two men were leaders, and that's really what we need. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I take your point that, that uh, a lot has not changed in certain ways in terms of the normal opposition, the normal dynamics. But, but what has changed is 90% of the capital flows into the developing world are private sector. Right. That means 10% is public sector. So whereas, whereas 
aid and other forms of, of uh, public uh, contributions were driving a large part of the economic development of countries or not, today it's private sector. Exactly. Four out of the five customers in the world are outside the United States. So I, I agree that we uh, have a certain set of dynamics that are locked in, but I also can't help but wonder, and this gets to your issue of leadership, if we can't do a better job of educating Americans about the benefits of trade, mm -hmm. laying to rest the question of whether or not there was that giant sucking sound and whether or not, in fact, NAFTA on balance has been a, a plus or a minus, uh, and try and help at least provide a little bit of clarity and, and, and fact-based reason, which I think this institute can do uh, to that. So um, I share your hope. You know, there's another aspect of trade which came up in uh, the class that I've had, unfortunately, too brief a visit with. There are also national security issues that are associated. People that trade with each other rarely fight each other. Um, you can think of Mexico, even though I grew up there and I don't think of it this way, but as the soft underbelly of the United States. Most of you probably aren't aware that Mexico has inflation down to 2%. Their job growth is 5% per annum right now because they've brought more people into legitimate economy because they revised their constitution, took advantage of a crisis, and changed the way their Senate and their Congress operates and approves economic activity. Uh, I always like to embarrass U.S. congressmen by telling them the Mexican government works better than ours. It does. It has a budget. Its deficit as a percentage of GDP is minor compared to ours. They actually have a budget. I mean, think about it. We don't have a budget in the United States. And they made these constitutional changes that have now led to ferocious, co I'm on the board of AT&T. Well, it's nice to be an oligopolist who's a force for democracy in another country, <laughs> which is what we're doing in Mexico. We're taking out Carlos Slim. Uh, this is all changed. It's one of the great success stories of all time. And that's what NAFTA implanted. Or you take the Korean Free Trade Agreement. Uh, the Korean Free Trade Agreement's not only a great economic accomplishment, but a powerful Asian economic machine. But remember, we have the DMZ. We have a hot war zone in Korea. And we should be working with our friends very, very closely to enhance their strength and economic ability. So I think the two are intertwined. In the case of the Trans-Pacific Agreement, I think that's important to lay the groundwork for China coming into the system. You and I are both a little bit smarter than Don Trump. We know that China wasn't part of the TPP. Um, and I thought uh, Rand Paul was very clever to point that out the other night. But they want to enter the system, and we want them to enter the system, but according to the rules of oil. And those rules will be established by these massive trade agreements. Mm -hmm. And looking at it from the perspective of, of an emerging market uh, or developing country, there's a clear correlation that has been, uh, I think, validated in several places. One study in particular done by the OECD in which countries that liberalize or reduce their trade barriers uh, generally engage in much more robust mm -hmm. and inclusive economic growth. Mm -hmm. How do we incentivize, how do we convince more of these governments uh, to be party to trade agreements? Because they're making, they're taking a political uh, risk. Yeah. But how do, and, and going back to your USTR days, what, what sort of toolbox do you have to incent countries to, to uh, make deals that, in effect, look like they're somewhat concessionary on their part, but ultimately will be very beneficial. Well, I want to go back to Mexico. They've completed more free trade agreements than we have. You would think they'd be more vulnerable. But we offer the biggest prize in the world, Rob, access to the most dynamic, remarkable, sizable, powerful economy, the United States. The real incentive is you open your doors and we'll open ours. But as I said in my comments, we're the epicenter now of global economic growth. Time after time after time, I remember a professor at Yale, Kennedy, Professor Kennedy, writing how Europe would take over the United States. Hasn't happened. And remember- Was Jap that before or after Japan? <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, then there was Japan as number one, Ezra Vogel, great professor at Harvard. Hasn't happened. And by the way, China, <coughs> it will not happen, in my opinion. They may have size and mass, 
But as long as they have the form of government that they have, and they try to contain the animal spirits or direct the animal spirits and don't let them blossom like George P. Mitchell did here in the United States or we do out in Silicon Valley, they can't compete on a full boar basis. They'll be big, but they won't be efficient and as innovative as we are. Well, let me ask you to elaborate a little bit on this. So how should the United States engage with China economically, in your opinion? Well, I'm a little biased on China. I, uh, so I'm 66 years old. My first trip to China was in 1948. Do the math. My parents were on the second to last ship to leave Shanghai before Mao's forces closed it down. And indeed, it was the SS President Wilson, <laughs> the founder of the Federal Reserve. <laughs> My mother was uh, pregnant with me. I was manufactured in China, <laughs> made in China. And then in 1979, I had the privilege of uh, President Carter, who I served the Secretary of the Treasury as his assistant, as you know. He sent 12 people to secretly meet with Deng Xiaoping and begin the process. We had lent railroad stock to uh, Chiang Kai-shek. And when the Reds took over, we froze, because they took the railroad stock, we froze $74 million in the Chase Manhattan Bank. And our job was to settle these differences. And I was part of that team just as a bag carrier for the Secretary of the Treasury, but I spent nine days with Deng Xiaoping. Uh, I mention that because he had the easy job. He released the masses. Take the women and men that Mao had suppressed, and to be rich is glorious. Doesn't matter if the cat is yellow or black, as long as it catches mice, let them out in the field. And so they created enormous volumes of production and the 8% growth record, or whatever the growth record has been, astonishing. The real difficult task right now in China is under Xi Jinping, to go from masses of production, volume, these big cities that have nobody living in them, the state-owned enterprise that are highly inefficient, a banking system that is rotten, because uh, it's all based on output to make for profitability and efficiency. My proudest moment when I served in the Carter administration was writing a briefing memo for the Secretary of the Treasury when he was going to meet with Leonid Brezhnev. Leonid Brezhnev was head of the Supreme Soviet. We still had a Soviet Union. And I said, he will submit to you, Mr. Secretary, the Soviets produce more tractors than the United States. Your answer, yes you do, but ours work. <laughs> and if John Deere tractors don't work, then Komatsu will take us out. That's how we are efficient. Well, I think that's the transition China is now making. Xi Jinping knows this, would like to achieve the transition, but they're control freaks and they're communists and they don't like dissent. So three weeks ago, the market had a reversal, Shenzhen, Shanghai, these are domestically traded markets. They're not as internationally globalized as Hong Kong. And they went out and arrested every journalist that talked about a market correction. And if you were short, you were put in prison. I don't mean short tall wise, I mean short stocks. So how do you let the animal spirits run? And how do you make this adjustment which he wants? I was invited last November, a group of six foreigners, just to talk about this with his 50 economists that are organizing this effort. But when you really push them, they don't want to lose control. And that's why I think it's just going to be bit by bit by bit by bit <coughs> with China. And if they don't make that transition, then they're just not going to become the powerful economic force other than sheer size that people expect them to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let me try to answer. There were some questions submitted. Let me ask you uh, a couple of those. Um, how does the money on deposit as excess reserves help to create jobs. It so doesn't. Please provide, <laughs> a, please provide a simple explanation. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it doesn't if it's sitting there because it sits there. And uh, we pay, or excuse me, the Federal Reserve pays 25 one hundredths of one percent, 25 basis points as they're called, uh, to the banks that keep that money on our balance sheet, the balance sheet of the 12 Federal Reserve banks. So. It's excess reserves, it's not creating jobs in the sense that uh, it's not being put to work in the real economy. If it is put to work in the real economy, then that means that banks want it and want to lend it out, particularly to the small and medium-sized businesses. Um, the other factor here is that uh, almost half of those excess reserves are held by foreign banks operating in the United States. So, um, but they're lending here in the United States. So. It's a good question because they're really not right now being put to work. Mm -hmm. 
they're excess by definition. And that's as simple an explanation as I can give you. Mm -hmm. um, among the uh, <coughs> proposals being tossed around in some of the Republican debates, one or a couple of them actually call for much greater oversight right. of the Fed. Would you share your thoughts on that with us? Yes, I sh I'd be happy to. <laughs> um, imagine a body who can't even make a budget running monetary policy in the United States. <laughs> I don't care if you're the former congressman from East Texas, whose name I won't mention, but his son is running for the presidency of the United States from Kentucky, and then, uh, or Bernie Sanders. Both of them led anti-Fed movements. Um, and they do have a constitutional argument in that the Congress is supposed to coin money for the United States. I'd like all of you who want the Congress to run monetary policy to raise your hand. <laughs> Not one of you because they can't even tie their own shoelaces. This is why the Fed was given a license by Congress to operate the way it does. And if it doesn't perform according to the rules given to it by Congress, they'll take the license away. But I know from history, whether you look at the Weimar Republic or you look at Argentina or any other country, that every time you turn monetary policy over to the fiscal authorities, to the legislatures, you end up with hyperinflation. Because it's the easy way out. You don't have to make tough budgetary decisions. Mm -hmm. So I am dead set against and would lie my body on the tracks of letting Congress <laughs> take control of monetary policy. Okay. Um, you've spent a fair amount of your career uh, either in Latin America or observing Latin America. Mm. What do you see as the economic promise of uh, Latin America? And, and what will some of the regional trade uh, agreements or efforts uh, result in? Well, first of all, I, I think there are good examples and bad examples. Uh, I don't consider Mexico to be part of Latin America. We, your dad, right. uh, and <coughs> those of us that tried to follow in his footsteps made it part of North America, but many people do consider it Latin America. Uh, Mexico is a great example of, there are two, Mex and <laughs> the other's definitely not in Latin America. Mexico and Poland are the two great economic success stories in the last 20 years. The reason is because they made complete structural changes. Poland didn't even have a recession. Probably the best finance minister or prime minister I've ever met anywhere still living were the Poles. And the Mexicans did the same. Brought about, they went from an agrarian society to an industrial exporting powerhouse. Money's now moving from China to Mexico, our auto industry is dependent on them, et cetera. Um, I mention this because the extreme opposite example, in addition to Argentina, which we talk about not being able to tie your shoelaces, is Brazil. Brazil produces two-thirds of the output of Latin America, south of, defined as south of Central America. It borders everybody. It has incredible natural gifts. But the old joke is, it's a country with potential and will always have potential. You had a brief period where President Cardoza, who had been a great finance minister, brought inflation down, created efficient economic gearing, and then the last few presidents have thrown that all out the door. So they did not change. They consumed. They kept their focus on being an agrarian commodity export plus iron ore. And now they're suffering. They're suffering from hyperinflation. And I'll give you my best indicator. Last time I was in Rio, a martini cost me 40 US dollars. That's scandalous inflation, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but um, so, and in between you have, of course, you've always had Chile as a decent economic model led by the Chicago School. It's a tiny little country, but has the rule of law and is efficient. So I think in the end, the rule of law is critical. I think structural change is important. And having, again, legislators who will make tough decisions and allow competition to take place. And really the only large country in what some people define as Latin America where that's happened is Mexico. Mm -hmm. The worst example right now in terms of a very large country is Brazil. Mm -hmm. You probably have had the experience I did, which is when you go into the foreign ministry in Brasilia, uh, which is the most ugly city in the world because it was all designed by the then president's son-in-law. He had the entire contract for a huge city. Uh, and you go up the stairwell of the foreign ministry you'll understand what Brazil's problem is. 
At the top of the stairwell is a giant portrait of Dom Pedro II, the emperor of Brazil. And they still think that way. They look down their nose at the rest of Latin society. They consider themselves to be an empire. And they can't break out of the mold of the fact that they're unique and don't have to change. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to sort of vary across the landscape of who's efficient, who's not efficient. I, I know you're doing a lot of good work in Colombia. That's another example of a success case. In what traditionally has been the most violent society in all of Latin America. But good leadership has brought about incredible economic change in Colombia. And yet look at its neighboring border, Venezuela, which is the worst outcome possible led by the worst case of socialism or bad leadership and dictatorship. So I would single out Mexico and Colombia as examples of success and Chile. And then I would set all the rest aside as bad examples to follow. Yeah, yeah. I think there are examples of where uh, countries have <coughs> uh, embarked upon uh, solid, inclusive economic development and growth programs without great leadership, but very few. Yeah. I mean, without leadership, uh, it's very difficult, very difficult. Singapore, by the way, if you, because Harry Lee just died. Look at what one man did with a little awful sewage entrepot, <laughs> which was caught between Malaysia and everybody yeah. else. What Lee Kuan Yew was able to engineer is an example of what a strong leader can do uh -huh. with the right incentives. It, it, that doesn't mean it can't be done elsewhere, it can be. Right, right. All right, last question. Um, no matter who enters the White House in, in January uh, of 2017, uh, the economy will very much be on the minds of, of most Americans and how to uh, engage people who have been left behind. Mm -hmm. You talked about <coughs> uh, realistic employment and the uh, issue of full employment. What should we be doing and what could a new president do to give some hope to those who feel like they're going to be left behind forever? Well, again, I want to put monetary policy perspective. What, what you do with monetary policy, I'll go to the back to the simple analogy of an automobile. You fill the gas tank. You give it the fuel that can propel forward economic activity. And the most important economic activity is job creation. Um, but. Uh, and I know Keynes is a bad word in certain circles, but he used to talk about the magneto. What he meant was the accelerator. Someone has to be incented, or someone has to provide the incentive to take that gasoline, and we have ubiquitous liquidity created by the Fed. Zero cost money, high octane money. To step on the accelerator and move the economy forward in terms of job creation, which is the only route to dignity. Have a job. And Again, there we have to get through this budget deadlock. Regulations that date from the Cold War that are no longer applicable to a globalized world. A tax system that disincentivizes everybody. Uh, and I would add one other thing. We have a huge skills mismatch in this country. We don't have enough engineers, we have to import them. There's even a shortage of truck drivers in America. We're 20,000 truck drivers short. There's an association of truck drivers, by the way. There's an association for everything in America. Remember Harry Truman's call someone a jackass? The Jackass Association gets on your back quickly. We're going to be 200,000 truck, 200, truck drivers short. I'm on the board of PepsiCo. Every Frito-Lay truck runs inventory. You have to do four-function math, and you have to be drug-free. It's hard for us to find drivers. They can't do four-function math because they're keeping an inventory for us, every little unit, and that's becoming, thanks to the cyberization society, more micro and micro and micro and micro directed. So um, I think education policy, which is, in my view, the, view, the role of the states, but the federal government's involved, that's where leadership is also needed, Bob. Mm -hmm. I, I, want, I want to be very clear here. There are limits to what monetary policy can achieve. Unless you have federal, fiscal, regulatory, and then you have educative policies. We cannot bring the people who have been not benefiting. And I, I will admit, and I criticize the policy internally, as what we were doing, given the skills mismatch in our society, is we were making it easy for the rich to get richer, and indeed they have. We did a little study at the Fed of doubts. We seceded from the union 
statistically speaking. It made Governor Perry very happy, by the way. <laughs> and we divided 15 years of income and job growth into four income quartiles. And uh, if you take Texas out of America, the two middle income quartiles over the last now 16 years have had job destruction and income declines. It's only when you put Texas back into the mix that it's positive. So that tells you that the guts and fiber and the muscle and the heart of America has been eviscerated. And we have to do something about it. I'm glad you identified uh, that. I, I hope that whomever is elected, whether it's a D or an R, understands that the key thing for our country is job creation and restoring dignity through employment. And how do you get that done? And the answer is you incentivize the private sector. Uh, I'm going to conclude because I was just looking at this class and I want to make sure we get the point. Uh, Sam Nunn, who's a former senator from Georgia, a great guy, worked so closely with Dick Lugar on disarmament, uh, told this story to me last year. He said a uh, backwoods preacher has a member of his congregation come in. He's got a drinking problem. He's embarrassing everybody in town. So he takes a glass of clear water and puts it on his desk. And then he takes a glass of whiskey and puts it on his desk. And he takes a worm and puts it in the glass of water. And the worm swims around very happy. He takes the worm out and puts it in the glass of whiskey. And of course, the worm really swims around happy for a little while and then drops to the bottom dead. And he looks across his desk at his parishioner and says, son, do you, do you get the message? And the fellow says, yes, I do. If I drink whiskey, I won't get worms. <laughs> now, <laughs> the answer is fiscal policy and political leadership. It's not letting the central bank print more money. And that's the point I want to make tonight. Otherwise, if we continue doing that, we will kill that worm. Got it. Richard, thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. We, we'd like to make sure that Ambassador Fisher doesn't forget about us. So we, we have a, 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 an excellent, lovely plaque. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty confident that it was made in the United States. And uh, would like to share it with him since he wasn't made in the United States. <laughs> And I will head back to my office and start taking the equations out of my research if you all take <laughs> your way home and drive very carefully. Thank you all for coming. Bye-bye. <laughs>